Somebody's in trouble. Huh? When we hear those sounds, we know somebody's in trouble. We don't know what it is, whether it's in a home or in a car or somebody's gathering for a picnic and had a problem. Or, but I always try to remember this. When I hear the siren sound, it means in our society somebody's in need, right? Whether it's a police car or whether it's an ambulance, that was an ambulance. So I think if we're going to make an impact, we ought to stop and pray. Because this God, God's in the midst of what's going on there, okay? Well, he's in the midst of what's going on here. And so, Lou, would you pray? Just ask God to meet the need, whatever it is. Would you please? In our, in our homes, it's a way, even in this circumstance, it's a way for us to serve others. And it's simple. It's not really difficult to do those things. But as I was preparing this, prepared to PowerPoint, had it all done earlier in the week, um, then this morning at 4 a.m., uh, I, I, I wake up early, so I was awake and laying in bed, and I, I, can't, I can't lay in bed for very long because I disturb Becky because I start tossing and turning and I'm thinking and and then I start preaching in my mind, you know. And I was going through this text again, because I've read this text several times this week in preparation for it and had done some work. But it kind of all came together laying in bed at 4, between 4 and 4.15. Then I got up at 4.15, came to the office, and started putting on paper uh, the things that were running through my head. And it's, as I approach this text, I want us, first of all, to read it. This is a text about the feeding of the 5,000. And, and, at, and at first glance, when you read through this, you see the 5,000. <laughs> you see the five loaves and the two fishes, and you see, you see this great miracle of Jesus where he performed this miracle in the presence of, of 5,000 men. Matthew says, uh, as you parallel the, the different texts, and this text is found in Matthew, it's found in Mark, it's found in John, a little glimmer of it in, in, in uh, Luke, but... Mainly the three major texts are Matthew, Mark, and John. But Mark's, or, uh, Matthew says that there was 5,000 men besides women and children. So uh, if, a, if a family only had three, there's 15,000 people in this event. That's a lot of people. More than likely, they're not American families. American families have, what, 1.3 children now? You know, I'm not sure how you get a third of a child. But um, anyways, uh, the, the, they had larger families. So there could be as many as 25, 30,000 people on the side hill uh, off the other, the other end of the Lake of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret. And so let's read this text and um, picking up in verse 30 of Mark chapter 6. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And I want to stop there and preface something that happened just prior to this. As they have returned to Jesus, he had sent them all out, and they had gone, and they had healed, and they had proclaimed, and they had touched lives. But in the midst of this process, if you'll, if you'll look at, over, you have a heading over verse 14? The murderer of John the Baptist, or the beheading, John the Baptist was beheaded. And so... Here you have, you have the disciples. John the Baptist was a great man in this day. 
And, and these guys have gone out and they're proclaiming and they're doing what Jesus says. And then they hear that John the Baptist had been beheaded. And they come in the verses prior to this, they come and they pick up his corpse without a head. His head had been delivered to, to the, into the court of the um, king. And anyways, and on a platter. But they came and they took his corpse and they buried his corpse. And right after they got done burying him, uh, verse 29, is they laid his corpse in a tomb. And then they come to Jesus. So they're coming to Jesus right after a major event took place where John the Baptist had been beheaded. They bury his corpse and now they're coming back and they're wore out. They're tired. And they come to Jesus and Jesus says again in verse 31, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there are, were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, to Jesus, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and, and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fishes, or two fish. Then he commanded them to make all them all sit down in groups on the grass, the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed, and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about five thousand men. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now, when evening came, the boat was in the midst of the sea, or in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him 
that they might just touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. Wow. What a great text. Great passage. Great miracle. Unbelievable things that had happened. And I got asking myself this question. What do you see? What do you see in the midst of this unfolding of the history of the life of Christ? What do you see? And I found as I read, read through this over and over and over again, I found this, that I don't always see, and in my own life, and I imagine it's possibly the same for you, I don't always see the things of God unfolding. The disciples for sure did not see like Jesus saw. They did not see the multitudes in the same way Jesus saw the multitudes. They did not even see the feeding of the 5,000, and they didn't even see the loaves and what had happened. They, their perception of it was skewered by their own circumstances. And many times we can experience the same thing. Many times what we see is not really the thing that God wants us to see. And so I'd like to take this text apart for the next half an hour or so. And uh, I would like to look it over and correlate it with some other things and other, whether it's Matthew or whether it's John, to help us understand how we might see the things that the Lord sees and, um, and participate in them. Because at the end of the day, if we do not, I believe that for my life and for your life, we will end up in the same place that the disciples ended up in verse 52. And that is, things of God are happening all around us, and we miss out on it totally because our hearts are hardened towards the things that he wants to teach us. And I think it's very important for us to take a look at this in light of these events and in light of the things that he wants us to see. If you'll look with me, please. Um, Jesus saw the need. He saw the need in verse 31. He saw the need as he looked at his disciples what was it in verse 31 that he saw that they had a need for? What was it? Rest. Jesus saw them. I want you to understand this. Jesus sees you in your circumstances of life. And he prescribed the exact thing that they needed. And that was some alone time with him and some rest. That's what he saw. And that's what he prescribed. In fact, he saw this as so necessary that when you come over or you drop down to verse 34. Now, remember, this is what happened. They're, they come up. The, Jesus sees them. They're, they're over. And, and they all come together to him. And then they said, they, he looks at them and he says, Boy, you guys look ragged. <laughs> you, need, you, you need some alone time. We need to, you need a little bit of vacation in our, our time. You need some rest. And so he gets them into a boat, and they go all the way across the sea, and they go over to a deserted place. I, a couple years ago, I was preaching on this message, and I had a PowerPoint slide up of what this area looked like. And it's all grassy land, and it's kind of a side hill, and it's around the Sea of Galilee. Well, that's where they went over there. And they went by boat, and they went across. And so and they get to the other side, and, and as the text says, the people, you know, the Sea of Galilee is not very big. It's bigger than Oneida Lake. It's probably twice as wide as Oneida Lake, but it's not that big. So the people see him getting into a boat, and what did the people do? They walked around the northern side of, of the Sea of Galilee, and they ended up over here. So when they get to the other side... The actual, the crowd got there before they got there. 
And Jesus, notice in verse 34, and Jesus, when he came up out, or when he came out, what did he come out of? The boat. When he came up out of the boat, what did he see? He saw the multitudes. He, this is what he sees. He saw the multitudes. Now I want you to notice a very important thing. What he saw in the need of his disciples was rest. Where were his disciples when he came up out of the boat? They're in the boat. And they're resting. Did he call for his disciples? Hey, guys. <laughs> Snap to it. Let's go. There's a multitude out here. He did not do that. He alone went to the multitude. He alone ministered to the multitude. Now, every one of them would have had a choice whether they wanted to come out or not. But every one of them chose to stay in the boat. I wonder, I wonder if any of them poked their head up out of the boat. <laughs> oh, brother. There's a multitude. But Jesus, when he came out, he saw the multitude. What was his reaction to the multitude? He had compassion upon the multitude. He had compassion. This this was in Jesus' mind as he went, we see him going. He goes to the multitude, and this is what he starts doing. In verse 34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude, and was moved with compassion for them, because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. So this is what he did. He began to teach them many, many things. Now, people come to Jesus. When, when we get over to the end of the text... Why did people come to Jesus? What was it? For healing. They brought their sick. And all they, they, their expectation was this. If, he, if we just touch the hem of his garment, we're going to be healed. And that happened. We see that in the, the woman with the issue of blood. All she said to herself is, all I have to do is reach through the crowd and but touch the edge of his garment, and I will be healed. And this is what was taking place. And people were coming by the groves to be healed. But Jesus saw past their physical need in this text to do what for them? Not just heal them, but to do what for them? Teach them. Teach them. Instruct them. Show them. Now I want to tell you something. Jesus sees your need. I, I, in, this, in a crowd like this, there's various needs in our lives. Various needs. But I want you to understand something. It can be the, the, the need that Donna has is different than the need France has. And the need that I have is different than the need Bob has. But Jesus sees our need. He saw the needs of his disciples. He met that need. He said, you guys need some rest. The, the, the ministry opportunities were all around them, but he met that need specifically. He saw the needs of the crowd and the multitudes that were before him and they came to get healed but in the midst of that opportunity he teaches them the things that they need to learn so that they will understand I believe the plan of God in the midst of it. it he taught them he also healed them the, another text says that they were healed and he also saw their need as later in the day, the day came, he saw the need of an empty belly. And he met that need. He met needs. But in the midst of the needs, and I want you to understand this, 
many different needs, and you have many different needs, and we as a church have many different needs, and people that are connected to this church have many different needs, and people in the community have many different needs, and Jesus understands those needs, but Jesus understands something even greater than the need that you might have as a felt need, and it is the real need, and that is to know him and hear from him and learn from him and grow through this process. I'm, uh, I, I, I love the fact that we have family Bible hour. And family Bible hour is so important to us as a church. But sometimes, sometimes, I, I've been thinking about this lately, sometimes I, I find that there's a need, we have a need, God's been impressing this upon my, my heart, there's a need to every now and then have the opportunity to sit down in a classroom type, not a classroom, but in a discussion type setting where we take a, a deeper, more foundational, funda sound is the word coming to me, a found, foundational, um, a deeper need to look at some of the doctrines of the Bible that we don't get a chance to discuss in a setting like this. Now, in membership class this morning, we had a great opportunity just to touch on um, the doctrine of anthropology as found in the scriptures. Just a little glimpse of it. And it reminded me of the necessity to learn deeper and deeper things. And sometimes we're, we're, we're bogged down in the needs that we have that are day-to-day -day needs, but the greater need in all of this is for us to know God better and to know his word better and to delve deeper and deeper into it and understand the very origins of who we are and where we came from, and why are we here, and the events that took place in order for us to say, this is who I am. I am a self-determining, self-aware creature, soulish creature of God, designed by God to function in certain ways and to do certain things. It is a need that we have, and God sees that need, and he has provided every situation for that need to be met for us. And sometimes we get, we, get, we get superficial in life and having a job and doing this and paying our bills and taking care of this and taking care of that. that, that those, are, those are felt needs. But the real need of our life is to know him. And Jesus sees this. And he understood the real need of his disciples. And he understood the real need of the crowd as he met those needs by teaching them. He did heal them. And eventually, he met their need, uh, physical need. Now, if you'll see the disciples, I want you to look at the disciples. Verse 35. When the day was now far spent, or it was at the end of the day, his disciples came to him. They finally came out of the boat. They came to him and said, this is a deserted place, which is what they really wanted to begin with. But this is a deserted place. Now the fact that this is a deserted place, even though it began to be the thing that they needed, they needed a place where there were not any people. Now the fact that this is a deserted place causes them another problem. What's the problem the deserted place caused them? There's 15,000 people in front of them, and there's no McDonald's. There's no place to eat. What would we do without McDonald's? I, I, I don't like McDonald's. But, um, I, not that I have anything against companies and so on. But, um, here they are. The very thing that they needed became the very thing that challenged them now. And the very thing that Jesus took them for is the very thing now he's going to confront them with in their real need, not their felt need. And he's going to confront them with the need even when you're dog-tired, boys. Even when you're tired. And I've given you some time to rest. But even when you're tired, you need to serve. 
and you need to serve these people. Look at what he says to them. When the day was now far spent, verse 35, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But Jesus answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. Here comes the tough part. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they're like all standing around. Jesus says, How many loaves do you have? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> go and see. Go and do something about this. Now, if you look at John's text, John said, Jesus was talking specifically to James, and James says, I, I don't know, James says, there's, uh, there's a kid here, there's a lad here, it's got, they, found, they must have found him quickly, here's a lad here, he's got five loaves and two fishes. It's interesting that the only one that came prepared is a little kid. <laughs> he's the only one that came prepared. And so Jesus takes these loaves and two fishes, and it's interesting that James says, Jesus says, you know, he says, how are we going to feed all these people in, in, in John, chapter, uh, John chapter 6? How are we going to feed all these people? And Jesus says, how much would it take to feed all of them? And uh, James must have been the mathematician. He's adding it all up. Uh, just, just a little bit for everybody, it's going to take 200 denarii. Just a little bit. This is where the 200 denarii comes from. It's just a little morsel. A little morsel is going to be 200 denarii. How much is a denarii? Anybody know? It's a day's wages. Mike, that's right, Mike. It's a day's wages. James is saying it's going to take 200 days' wages to feed all these people. Can you imagine having 20, 25,000 people come to your house? How much would it take you to feed all them? Winnie's probably saying, Daniel can eat for 10. <laughs> it's a lot of money. And they're like, it is our responsibility to feed these people? And Jesus is saying, yes. It is your responsibility to feed them. And obviously, he knew what he was going to do. And in verse 38 again, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fishes, or two fish. Then he commanded them to, for them to make all sit down in, the, in, the, in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in ranks of hundred and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. Now, Jesus sees, when he sees the two, or the five loaves, let's imagine we put five loaves and two fish. When he sees the five loaves and two fish, what does he see? The provision of God. And he says, it's enough. He sees the very ability of what God has entrusted him. He sees this is enough. The disciples see, are you kidding? Are you kidding? They do not. Now, listen, he has sent them out to proclaim the gospel. He has sent them out so they would heal. He has sent them out to do miracles. He has sent them out to see and do things that they never thought were possible. And they, in this situation, they look at five loaves and two fishes, and they think, are you kidding? He looks at it and says, what's the difference? 
between what I have given you to do and this, this is nothing. This can turn into everything that you need. And this is the point that I want to make. They didn't even see the loaves. Why? Verse 52 is very clear. They did not even understand the loaves. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. Hardened towards what? Hardened, I believe, towards the very plan of God and what he had designed and what he had given to him. Remember, they had just returned from weeks of ministry. They just returned from burying the corpse of John the Baptist in the ground. They just returned from all of this. And they were dog-tired. And it didn't go like they thought maybe it was going to go. Things were difficult. And the crowds were huge. And they looked at all of it. And it caused them, I believe, to be discouraged. And when they became discouraged over the events that happen in life, and those events can take you down a path that is terribly destructive. I shared with you last week about an event in BCP's history, actually Fellowship of Baptists for Home Missions, the mission agency before BCP. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who looked at that circumstance and could have become very, very discouraged and overwhelmed in it because they were looking at possibly losing all of their retirement funds that they had invested in that. But instead, they rose to the occasion and they believed God against all the odds of the whole thing. And, and they saw it for what it was. And they became overcomers in the midst of it because they did not get their eyes on the things of life. They kept their eyes on the Savior from heaven. And that made all the difference in the world for those people. And here in this situation, the disciples have gotten their eyes off from Jesus. They're not, when they're looking at those five loaves, they're not seeing all the possibility and the potentiality of the Son of God who they believe is the one they're following. And all they're doing is they're looking at the loaves. Their eyes are coming off the loaves, and they're not looking at Jesus. They're looking at the multitudes of people. And their focus became wrong. And they look at the loaves and they say, are you kidding? I kind of correlate this to, uh, you know, that, that pumpkin field out there. <laughs> it's not what we expected it to be. We, we envisioned when we out there on that Thursday night, those of you who were here, we envisioned that, that two acres out there just being Full of pumpkins. That's what we envisioned when we were out there planting those seeds. Pumpkin fest. Well, I want to tell you, if you look out there right now, I don't know if you see anything other than weeds and a little bit of corn. And it would be very easy for us and for me to look at that and say, man, we've been trying this for two years. And what in the world is wrong? And, and all we see is the things that are in front of us. But I want to tell you, down underneath those weeds, as I was walking up in the upper part the other day, down under weed, and mixed into all of that, is the wonderful-sized pumpkins that are under there that will make Pumpkin Fest happen. And you've got you to gotta, you gotta think about what, to, you know, what is it that you see in the midst of it. And Jesus saw these things. He, saw, he sees your need, but he also understands what the real need of our heart is, and he's going to work, and he's going to invest his time into teaching us this is what is important. 
Pumpkins are not important, but what we do with them is important. Weeds are not important, but what we envision or what we see in those can take us way off from track, way off track. Jesus saw the possibilities. The disciples couldn't get past the problems. I want to show you something else Jesus saw in this text. If you'll go over to uh, verse 47. Now when evening came, uh, I want to back up just one, one moment to make a, a point. Verse 45. There's a, a very emphatic verb used in this verse. It is... It is an, an imperative emphatic. It's an emphatic imperative, I should say. And it says this in verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat. Now, I've always wondered, why is that so emphatic? It's an emphatic imperative. It's like, g get in a boat. It's almost like, you know, um, uh, uh, a danger is present. And a parent sees the danger, and they make an emphatic imperative. Don't, 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 do, don't do that. <laughs> watch out, watch out. And that's the kind of language that's used here. And I've often wondered, why is it so imperative that these disciples get into the boat? Jesus has been trying to work to get them out of the boat <laughs> and get them engaged. And he's saying to them, listen, you know, you, you guys, you need to feed the multitude. Uh, what, what do you have? And he's engaging them in it. And then all of a sudden, right in the middle of the text, he says, hey, hey get, get in the boat. Well, when you go over to John chapter 6, if you would, please. They were in grave danger. And they didn't even know it. John chapter 6. They were in grave danger. And we find the danger that these disciples were in because of their mindset. We find it in verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they, the crowd, the multitude, were about to come and take him by force to make him king. He departed again to the mountain by himself. Just a little statement. But this is the danger for the disciples. Remember, the disciples are struggling with Jesus about service. Jesus is giving them some time. He saw their need. But I'll tell you what, the needs are all around us, and there's only so much time that we have to, to rest and to take a little bit of a breather. But the multitude and the need for work and the need for serving him is all around us, and Jesus understood this. And when they came out, he said these things to them. Listen, uh, you know, see the multitudes. And they're like, yeah, we see them. And where are they going to buy food? Jesus says, you feed them. Uh, no, no, we're not going to feed them. They need to go into the highways, you know, in the villages, and they need to buy themselves, find their own McDonald's. And Jesus says, no, how, many, how much do you have? And they say, oh, we got two, three, five loaves and two fish. It's enough. And they look at it and say, you're kidding me. And in the midst of this mindset comes this danger for the disciples the crowd starts to rise up. And the crowd starts to say, and Jesus perceives this rising out of the crowd, and they want to, by force, make him king. Take him back around the northern part of Galilee, up around and down to Jerusalem, and bring him into Jerusalem and set him up as king wherever they were going to do it. But he perceived that the crowd was rising to this, and this became grave danger for the disciples. And this is why I think we find the emphatic imperative in Luke, or in Mark chapter 6, 
where Jesus says, hey, 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 get in the boat. He needed to get them out of there because they were in grave danger of saying, oh, that sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, let's rise him up. Let's make him king. Because it's not too many weeks ahead, they're in the upper room, and what are they saying in the upper room to him? Uh, which one of us will sit on your right hand? And which one of us will sit on your left hand? Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus perceives this. He sees it. And he sees the dangers in your life. And there are sees the dangers in my life. And sometimes he says emphatically to us as we're reading his word, you need to stop that right now. You need to change. You need to get over here. You need to get in this place. You need to get your head screwed on right and get out of this thought that this is all about you. This is not about you. This is about the very kingdom of heaven, and this is about the plan of God, and you're going to get in the way of it if you're not careful. So he removes them immediately. And they get in the boat, and they wander out to sea. And they're out there in the middle of the boat. They're out in the middle of the sea, rowing their hearts out. Contrary to what? The winds and the waves. If you'll look with me back in Mark chapter, four, chapter 6, verse 47. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he alone was on the land. That was after he sent the multitudes away all by himself. There's another thing he sees, verse 48. Then he saw them str straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. Matthew says all they saw was a ghost, what they thought was a ghost. See, their, their vision was totally impaired. Verse 49, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and it says it here also, and it says it in Matthew, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. Matthew says they were terrified. They were afraid because they didn't see and they didn't understand and when he came up into the boat, the rest of the text says he came up in the boat, and they're all marveling. How is that possible? And Jesus says, didn't you see the loaves? <laughs> didn't you see the glory of what I did in your midst? And they were like, uh, uh, we didn't, what, what happened? They didn't even understand that thousands and thousands of people had been fed. Why? Because they didn't see Jesus. And they didn't see the need. As that last PowerPoint slide, they didn't see the need. They had lost the vision of what these are for. And they are to serve the God who bought you and I with a price. Ladies, you may not like it, but serve your husband. Husbands, don't you dare demand it. You love her as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You want to be like Christ? You strip away all of the thought. I deserve this. You strip that away. And you put on service in these hands. This church want to grow? I'll tell you how it will grow. You serve people. This church didn't start by just an idea. Somebody said this morning, 
you know, something about church. And I said, yeah, but you weren't here in the early days when there was nothing <laughs> except Frank and Jenny. Remember those days? Frank and Jenny, Matt and Beth, just a young married couple. There was Jill as a single girl in the nursery. And in the very early days, I think, and there was Heather with Jasmine was just a little baby. Remember Jasmine? You, you don't remember any of that. You were just a little bitty baby. Heather came with Jasmine, Frank and Jenny, Jill, Matt and Beth. I don't, Kaylee was just a little baby too, and Becky and I. And all it was was a dream. But I want to tell you what it took. It took everybody doing their part. And it didn't take somebody sitting on the sidelines. Well, I don't know. That's a really big crowd. There sure are a lot of weeds out there. I don't know whether I'm going to get involved or not. Unfold the arms of judgment and open the hands of service. It's the only way. It's gonna, this is what changes homes. This is what changes your interaction in a community. This is what changes marriages. When a wife says, I'm going to serve my husband. I'm going to honor him. Even when he doesn't deserve it. Husband saying, I'm going to love my wife unconditionally. She is number one in my life after Christ. She is number one. And guys, if you treat any other woman better than you treat your wife, then you ought to get on your knees and you ought to confess to God your sin and change it. Only you will change it. And you serve. And you serve. Jesus is trying to get these disciples to learn service. He meets them. He gets into the boat. They're totally amazed. How in the world did he do that? And yet they missed something far greater in the feeding of the 5,000. He had to force them into a boat so they would not get in the way of ruining the very plan of God in what he was doing. Getting ready for the coming cross. I want you to notice, and I read the last part, because nothing really changes from 53 on. There's still the crowds. There's still the, the needy people. There's still the lost. And I encourage us as a church that we would unfold our arms and we would open our hands and say, God, how can I serve? This is what victory looks like in the plan of God. And I don't know how many years I have left in serving him, but I'll probably preach till I die. But um, the energy it takes to serve others is a lot. And any of you, even in your home, know what it means to serve another and how hard it is. But you serve in your home. Uh, the strength of the church is found in the strength of the home. And then you serve in the church and you serve in your community and it goes out from there. And I encourage you to serve Christ. To serve Christ. And uh, the way the disciples overcame a hardened heart was, number one, to get their eyes back on Jesus. And that's what happened in the boat. He instructed them. And they got refocused. And he came back into view. And they saw him for who he was. Even though they didn't see him for who he was in the feeding of the 5,000, the boat experience brought them back into focus. And when they landed in Gennesaret, they came up out of the boat and they looked and here's a whole multitude of people. And they went back to work. It's time to get to work. It's time to serve him. Don't miss out on it. Otherwise you'll terribly regret it.
when you have to stand before him and give an account. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this passage. It's, uh, it's a good reminder to us, a good reminder of our need to make sure we have our eyes and our ears focused in the right direction. It's very easy. God, I see this happen all the time. In our own lives, in my life, it's easy to get out of focus. It's easy to get our eyes off from you. It's easy to get our eyes on people, circumstances. What? You want me to feed them? Almost as if they're unworthy of it, but somehow we are worthy of your graciousness in our lives. Help us to get our eyes off of ourselves. Help us to find individually and corporately that boat experience where we come out of it ready to serve. Help us to evaluate our own hands. Help us to get involved. Help us to serve others. The old song, Father says, make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant. I pray that that will be who we are. Bless our lives this week. Help us to be attentive. Help our wives in the home, our husbands in the home. Help our children to learn what service is through our lives. Help us in our church and in our community. Thank you that Bob and Melanie are willing to step up and serve you as family Bible hour teachers to our teens, which we've been praying about. Thank you for the teachers that every week study and serve and teach for those who mow the grass and clean the building and prepare meals and get this, and our deacons serving and all these, help us, Lord, together, corporately, but individually to do our part. Help, to, help us, God, to guard us from standing on the sidelines with our arms crossed, wondering why things didn't get done, but to unfold our arms and step into the fray of service. Might we do that for your glory and for our well-being, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. Remember, tonight, posters and roasters at our house, 4 o'clock. And about 9.30, I go to bed. So, you know, if you're still there, have fun. <laughs> Have a good day.